Welcome back, and thank you for visiting my YouTube channel. My name is Terrence Williams, and I am a student of the word of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, being obedient to what I believe the Holy Spirit is leading me to do. Thank you for tuning in with me. As I stated in the last video, the prophecies of Jesus Christ do not end with the Gospels. Jesus revealed many things to John to write to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Paul, Peter, John, the writer of Hebrews, and Jude contained epistles or letters that were prophetic, and the book of Revelation is definitely prophetic about the end times. Today, we'll begin to, to cover the prophetic letters to the churches. The title of this video is called, From Jesus to John to the Church at Ephesus. As we cover the letters of the churches in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, allow me to highlight some things. The churches that received these letters all existed in Asia Minor along with other churches during that time. But these seven churches represented the spiritual conditions of the churches that existed at that time. Historically, we can look back at these churches and see how the church has progressed and how similar what we go through now is to what they went through then. Even though the letters were written to each church and specific to the church, the same strengths and weaknesses that they had exist in the body of Christ today. Even though the letters were written to individual churches, the members of those churches went through things on an individual basis. And you may see similarities between what goes on with you personally and what was going on with them. That's because the letters are timeless. They would have been written by John around 94 to 96 AD. The church would have been around 60 years old or a little more. It would have grown quite a bit even though it would have already gone through extreme persecution. Christians would have been being crucified, burned to death, and thrown to wild animals for professing Christianity. Believers would have more than likely been becoming afraid and unsure about their future and not knowing whether or not they were strong enough to stand up to all the adversity that they had faced and the adversity to come. These letters reveal Christ's end time plan and would have been to empower believers to overcome the enemy and give them hope for the future. See, Jesus knows our strengths and weaknesses. He suffered the same while on this earth and more. His message today is the same as it was then. So open your spirit as we dive into Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 through 7. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place. Except thou repent, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. At first glance, it opens up stating unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write. We know that this is Jesus telling John what he wants him to write to the church of Ephesus. But why is Jesus telling John to write it to an angel of the church? We know that in our churches today, we don't have angels leading the church. A good study Bible will give you numbers next to words that points you to the reference that will give you an equivalent translation a similar meaning, a synonym, to help better understand what something is saying. In mine, there's a letter one next to the word angel. And when I go to the reference, it says messenger. So that tells me that unto the angel 
is saying unto the messenger of the church of Ephesus, write. So Jesus wants John to write the letter to the church of Ephesus, to the angel or messenger of the church and say the things that one, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks is saying to them. Who is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks? It should be obvious that the answer to this is Jesus, because Jesus is the one who is revealing all of this to John, wanting him to write it to the seven churches. But if you go back to Revelation chapter 1 verse 1, it tells you this whole entire book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. If that doesn't convince you, Jesus begins to speak to John in chapter 1, and John says he turned to see the voice that was speaking with him in verse 12, and in verses 12 through 16, it describes what he saw, and he saw seven golden candlesticks, in the midst of them was one like the Son of Man in white garment down to the foot girded around the chest with a golden band, white hair like wool, eyes like a flame of fire, feet like fine brass burned in a furnace, voice like the sound of many waters, with seven stars in his right hand. Now that we know it's Jesus, what are the seven stars and the golden candlesticks? Verse 20 tells us the mystery. The seven stars are none other than the angels or messengers of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks or lampstands are the seven churches themselves. So we see Jesus holds the angels or messengers of the seven churches in his right hand and walks among the seven churches. Today, the messengers of the churches would be the leaders of the churches, the pastors and anyone else in leadership. While this could be talking about actual angels and many other times throughout the scriptures, when it speaks of angels, it's literally talking about angels. In this case, these letters are written to the seven leaders of the church because angels wouldn't have been leaders of a church. The city of Ephesus, which today would be in what we know as Turkey, was one of the most important commercial and religious cities in Asia Minor. One of the most famous temples, the temple of the goddess Artemis or the goddess Diana, was located in the city of Ephesus. The temple was great in size, double the size of other Greek temples, and it was regarded as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was also the headquarters of John before he was exiled, and it served as the mother church to all the other churches, which were connected by the same Roman road. Jesus starts off with something good. He starts off commending them for what they do, Apparently, they were working hard because Jesus says he knows how hard they work and how they never give up. They obviously don't entertain evil because he knows that they can't bear to accept evil people. They have tried the spirits to see if they are of God or not. They have tested those who say that they are apostles, but really they aren't. And that they have found them to be nothing but liars. They aren't just going around accepting everyone who claims he is an apostle. This church has not fainted and seems to be grounded in the word and has remained faithful to the word and the Lord since it was founded. Now we see Jesus condemn them. The people have come under the discipline of Christ. Why? Because they have left, not lost, but left their first love or their former devotion to Christ. Their passion has become cold. We aren't told exactly what happened. Maybe the church had gained some so much worldly experience and, and knowledge that healing and deliverance weren't on their minds. Maybe some of the world music crept into the church unaware. Maybe they had begun to entertain more than focus on teaching the word and truly drawing people into Christ. That kind of stuff definitely happens in churches today. But nonetheless, we can say that whatever Jesus is condemning them about, they aren't working as hard as they were. They could be entertaining evil. They may have stopped trying the spirits to see if they are God. 
they may have been starting to faint from the difficulty of persecution or straying from the word, all of which would not be good. Jesus didn't counsel them or warns them to remember the devotion they once had for Christ, to repent of their present lack of love and devotion and return to their first works, the things that Jesus was commending them about in the first place. Or the result would be that Jesus would remove the church's candlestick, their lampstand, their light out of its place. In other words, if they didn't repent, Jesus would remove the church and we know that today, Ephesus is in ruins and its church is gone. How many churches today are lifeless, dull, and mechanical? How many lack the light that can truly draw sinners in? How many lack the actual witness of Christ and his power? How many of us individually are lifeless, dull, mechanical in our worship? Lack light to give to others when we are supposed to be, as the word says, the light and salt of the world and we lack witness of Christ and his power. There are churches and individuals today that need to repent and turn back to their first love right now. Now Jesus gives them a promise or seems to give them some light at the end of the tunnel. He says the church at Ephesus hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus also hates. Notice Jesus doesn't say that they hate the Nicolaitans. They don't hate the sinner, they hate the deeds or the sin of the sinner as Jesus does. Much about the Nicolaitans is still today obscure, unknown or uncertain, but later in chapter two, verses 14 and 15, we can find out a little about the Nicolaitans and their sin when Jesus is condemning the church at Pergamos for having among them those that hold to the doctrine of Balaam and for having around them those that hold to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Now we know from the book of Numbers that Balaam tried to prostitute his prophetic gift for money that was offered to him by Balak, the king of Moab. See, Moab wanted him to curse the Israelites, but Balaam did not want to do this. Instead, he put together a scheme to have some Moabite women seduce the Israelite men into marriage, which resulted in a blasphemous union of Israel with fornication and feasts of idolatry. The teachings of the Nicolaitans led to the same behavior as Balaam's schemes. So the church of Ephesus hated the things that the Nicolaitans did or taught that led to the same wicked results of Balaam's scheme. We as individuals and as a church body of Christ need to learn to hate the sin and not the sinner too. In my opinion, we must develop a set of spiritual eyes that looks at the spirit behind the actions of the people in front of us. It's like we know as believers that we fight against powers, rulers. We fight against the spiritual realm, but we can't get past what we see with our own physical eyes and the hurt we feel in the physical to really combat the evil spirit behind something and hate the spirit and the sin, but not the person. We have to walk around with this sinful flesh, but we need to live in the spirit as we deal with the wickedness of this world. Everyone who hears should listen to what the spirit says to the churches. We all have ears, but we must be able to hear this with our spiritual ears and see it with our spiritual eyes. And the only way you can do that is to hear it with the heart that you receive when you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and believe in him in your heart. See, Jesus promises that the overcomer, the Christian, will be given the tree of life to eat of, the same tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. That's it for this video. We will take a look at the letter to the church of Smyrna. And until then, thank you for viewing this video and I look forward to posting more as the Holy Spirit leads me to. Remember, Hebrews 3.13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Make use of today, because there may not be a tomorrow. These are distressing times, and more perilous times will come. They might tempt us to return to a worldly system that is ineffective. Encourage each other to continue to trust in Jesus Christ, so that none of us rejects the gospel, hardens our hearts, and become antichrist through the lies and the deception of this world. Don't put off salvation. 
it might be the last opportunity. Be encouraged and remember to like and share this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you.